Amen. Friends, I invite you to remain standing as the word of God is brought to be read in the midst of our congregation, to be read in the middle of the community of faith. We are starting our new sermon series, What God Wants for You. So often when we come to stewardship, we just picture God demanding things from us. Rather, stewardship and all of the gifts in it are just that. They are gifts. They are things that God wants for us. Today we turn on World Communion Sunday to the gift of diversity. And I invite you to hear a story about diversity, a very familiar story from Genesis chapter 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words, and they migrated from the east. They came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they made bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a great name for ourselves. Otherwise, we, will be, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to the city and the tower which the mortals had built. And the Lord said, look, they are one people and they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they do, nothing that they propose to do will be impossible for them now. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they left building the city. Therefore it was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. Friends, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing unto you, for you are this community's rock and redeemer. Amen. So friends, this morning, in just a little while, we are all going to gather around the table of Holy Communion. And as we gather around the table, we are joining congregations around the globe who will also be gathering around the table to celebrate Holy Communion. On World Communion Sunday, we celebrate two of the, two of the great gifts that God gives to us, gifts that are evident in Holy Communion, and those are the gifts of unity in Christ and the gift of diversity. Unity and diversity. We talk a lot about these words, don't we? We talk about unity and diversity, but oftentimes we talk about them as in unity or diversity. We speak really highly of both of them. We want, we, we, want, we long for unity. Do we not? We long for unity. We, we say things like, wouldn't it be great if we could all just get along. We've been saying it this past week, the past two weeks, the past month, the past year, the past couple of years in our national and political climate. You know, wouldn't it be great if our elected leaders would not be united behind their party line, but would instead be united as Americans? We cry out for unity. We even see this happening within our own denomination, the United Methodist Church. We as a denomination are grappling with with large issues, especially the issue of human sexuality. And in the midst of that grappling, we hear these cries for unity, folks who say, can't we just focus on what we agree on? Can't we just unite around the things that we know we agree? We long for unity. And yet, when I asked on my Facebook page yesterday, what's so great about diversity? I got dozens of responses. We also love diversity. We love diversity because how boring would it be if everyone was all like me? Maybe not me specifically, but like one of y'all. I'm just teasing. It would be boring if we were all like me, 
If we were all like one person, diversity is the spice of life. We love diversity as a, a biologist on my Facebook page said, she loves diversity because diversity means healthy populations. We love diversity because diversity leads to choices, leads to choices. We love diversity because diversity means friendships, relationships, and knowledge. We love diversity, but yet we also know that diversity is hard. Diversity and differences bring challenges. So then we hear those cry, those cries, those pleads for unity. Well, as it turns out, this is a song that humanity has been singing throughout history. This, this tension between unity and diversity, the love, the, the, the appreciation for diversity, yet the longing for unity. In the days of Noah, when Noah landed the ark on the dry land and he got off, God spoke to Noah and gave God three commands. God told Noah and his descendants to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth. Noah and his descendants did just that. They were fruitful. They multiplied their number. Their family tree grew lots of branches. And then years later, generations later, after Noah had passed away, the number coming from Noah, the, fam the, the descendants of Noah was quite, quite great. So this large number of people all coming from Noah, they looked around and they found the perfect spot to live and so they settled there. And they looked at all they have and they thought to themselves, isn't it great to be alive right now? Look at, look at all of us who are so wonderful and so beautiful and so alike. We are so great. And look at this beautiful land. This is where we should be. And so they settled there. They, they forgot. No. They ignored those three commands that God gave to them way long ago through Noah. That be fruitful and multiply, check, check. They did that. But this idea of fill the earth, of fill the earth, of go out from one place, they didn't like that. They didn't like that. They didn't want to fill the earth. They wanted to settle where they were together. So they devised a plan they devised this plan that they were going to build a great city. Come, they said, let us build a great city and a tall tower. It's going to be the tallest tower. It's going to be the best tower. No one is going to believe this tower. No one will ever build another tower that will be like our tower. Our tower will be so impressive that even God will be impressed. Speaking of that, we should build it tall enough so that God can see it and we can be closer to God. Otherwise, if we don't get to work on this city and building this tower, God is going to force us out. God is going to scatter us across the face of the earth and God is going to confuse our languages. Have you ever noticed that detail? Have you ever noticed that detail in the story of the Tower of Babel? Otherwise... If we don't build this city in this tall tower, if we build the city, we need to build the city, this tall tower, because otherwise God will scatter us. Otherwise, we're going to have to move. Otherwise, we won't all be able to stay together. Otherwise, we will all be different. Otherwise, we're going to have to deal with diversity. So let's build this tower. So let's build this tower so that God does not spread us apart. Let's build this tower so we can all stay together. Let us build this tower so that we can stay together in our sameness. Let us build this tower so that God doesn't spread us. They know what we know. 
They know that diversity is hard. When given the choice to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, when given the choice to do that, or to grow, to stay, to, to stay the same, to stay together, they chose to cloister rather than comply with God's command to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. They know what we know to be true. Diversity is hard. Diversity is physically hard. Bishop Will Willimon in his book, Fear of the Other, he talks about how diversity takes a toll on our brains because our brains have to work harder whenever we come in contact with someone who is a stranger. When we come in, when we encounter a stranger, our brains have to start working and processing, looking at that person, processing whether or not this person is a threat or if they have something to offer us or some kind of reward. Our, our brains begin to process, determining whether or not we should move into this encounter or we should get ourselves out of it and that we should back out of this encounter and avoid the stranger. It is physically easier to be with people who look like us, talk like us, think like us, vote like us, watch the same news programs that we watch, live in the same kind of neighborhoods we do, shop at the same kind of stores, share the same kind of values. It is physically easier to be with people who are like us. When we see someone who is familiar, someone who looks like we do, when we encounter someone who talks like we do, when we encounter someone who spends time in the same kind of places where we spend time, our brains relax. Diversity is hard. So I wonder, I wonder in what ways do we today build our own cities and tall towers to protect ourselves from diversity? In what ways do we devote a lot of energy to preserve our sameness, to preserve our homogeneity, to protect ourselves from having to encounter someone who is different. Sometimes we do this very knowingly. We only go to certain places. We only participate in certain groups. We only spend time with certain people. As soon as we find out that so-and-so voted the way they did, we don't call so-and-so to hang out anymore. We go to a place and we realize that the people in that place don't look like us. We don't go to that place anymore. Sometimes we do it unknowingly because we've grown so comfortable with the people who are around us that we no longer realize the lack of diversity. We grow comfortable in the sameness. So I can't help but wonder and ask, in what ways do I, in what ways do we, continue to build towers to preserve our sameness and to protect us from diversity? As the story of the tower goes on, God eventually finds out about that tall tower that humans are building. And so God goes down to their tower. Do you catch that? They were building this tall, impressive tower up to heaven. And then God came down to see this little tower that humanity was creating. God came down to see their cute little tower. God did the very thing that the people had feared the most. God did exactly as they had feared. God confused their languages and God spread them out across the face of the earth. But far from being a punishment, this response was a gracious response that 
gently nudged humanity out of their comfort zones, that nudged humanity to go out and enable them to, to comply to the command to fill the earth. Now that they had confused languages and were spread, it would be hard for humanity to come together to try to preserve their homogeneity. It would be hard for them to come back together to just build a city connecting them to in their sameness. This gracious act of God of scattering the people, of confusing their languages, gave the people a way to live into the gift that God had given them, the gift of diversity. God gifted them, God gifted us with confused languages and spread us across the world so that we wouldn't be able to only unite around our sameness. God gifted us so that we could receive the gift of diversity, the gift of God's plan for diversity. For diversity was always God's plan, always God's gift. But perhaps you're wondering, if we if we in our culture use these words, unity and diversity, and we use them with that either or language, well, well, what does God think about unity? I thought we liked unity. I thought unity was a good thing. We sing about unity. Doesn't God like unity? The story of the Tower of Babel read in the context of the whole Bible, reveals to us that unity and diversity are not mutually exclusive. Unity and diversity are not polar opposites. The opposite of diversity is not unity. The opposite of diversity is sameness, is homogeneity. The opposite of diversity is narrow-mindedness. The opposite of diversity is exclusion. The opposite of diversity is believing that my way is the way. My thoughts are the right thoughts. <laughs> that my perspective is the only perspective. The opposite of diversity is not unity. The opposite of diversity is narrow-mindedness and exclusion. Diversity is a gift from God in the way that we fully embrace and experience diversity is to humble ourselves to see in others the gifts that they bring to the table. Diversity requires our humility. Diversity requires our vulnerability. Diversity requires our willingness to, to, to risk getting, getting to know someone else, risk for the war, rewards of relationships and knowledge, for it's in risking relationships with someone who is different than us that we can grow, that we can learn more, that our very minds can be broadened, that our very understandings can be widened. The only way that we can embrace diversity in the way that and not be, the only way that we can embrace diversity and not to be torn apart by it is if we find ourselves in, united by something much deeper than our sameness. And the only unity that is deeper than our sameness is the unity that is found in God and Jesus Christ. This is the unity that Christ Jesus brings. This is the unity about which the Apostle Paul writes in Galatians when he says there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. The only way that diversity works, the only way that it truly is a gift is if we find, if we ground our unity in our deepest, in our, our deepest identity, in our core identity, the identity that we receive in our baptism as a child of God, as a sister and brother of Jesus Christ. And recognizing that for the other person 
even the person with whom you vastly disagree, even the person who looks differently than you, even the person who speaks differently than you. Embracing unity and diversity requires us to look at another person, even that person who votes differently, thinks differently, feels differently, talks differently, lives differently. The only way to embrace diversity with unity is to look at that person and to remember that that, that person is also a person of sacred worth for whom Jesus Christ died and rose. When we, can find, when we can ground our unity in Christ alone, we can receive the gift of diversity. That's another reason that I love coming to the table every, every time we do, and especially on World Communion Sunday. Because as I've said, this is a, play, this is a table where we come to have our greatest needs met mercy and forgiveness, our greatest needs, but it's also a place where we can come to have our greatest desires met. We so desire unity, and this is the table where that unity is offered, where that unity is proclaimed. Thanks be to God.